up at the top right hand corner there to tell you that the meeting is now being recorded. Lovely. So here we go. So welcome to the session this afternoon, which is comparing web conference tools. I hope you enjoy the session. And just to mention, if something goes wrong, i.e. the screen freezes or you get kicked out of the room or things aren't happening the way you expect them to, just close out of your browser window and literally rejoin us using the links that we sent you in order to get back into the room. You should just be able to get straight back in. There's no permissions or anything like that. But don't worry. Just join us back if you can. First thing I want to have a look at then is what the session is going to be about this afternoon. So I'm literally just going to start with the introductions, as in what's going to be covered, what we're going to look at today. I am going to start off and kick off with an Adobe Connect demo. And for those of you who did come on the Teaching in an Online Classroom session back in July, I did go through quite a few of the tools. But today is just to concentrate on those tools. So it is, there's a few more that I've included there for you to have a look at. We're then going to go over to what Collaborate looks like. And Gillian's going to talk us through that one. And then we've got Fiona, who's going to take us through GoTo and also Skype for Business. We've also done a comparison table in Excel, which has a look at all the different uh, features that each one of the pieces of software has. And we've put um, information about what it does, what it doesn't do. And we are going to share that with you. So we are going to give you a link to that, because it is a really useful resource, I especially think so. And then towards the end, we're going to have a look at any questions and answers. So we will try and keep an eye on the chat pod. Hopefully, <laughs> uh, we will be able to keep an eye on that and answer any questions as we go through. But we have tried to accommodate all of the questions that people sent us beforehand. So facilitators this afternoon, that's me at the top there. I'm Jane. I'm from the University of Leeds. I am an IT trainer. We've also got Fiona from the University of Brighton and Gillian from Salford University. I shall let them introduce themselves as they come in. So we have got this session scheduled for an hour. We will try our best not to make it uh, overrun. Uh, and if you do need to leave at 1.30 and we're still going, please do feel free to leave. But we will try to keep on track. The whole point of coming on to an online session is that you participate. So please, please do join in. If you've got any questions, use some of the emoticons that I'm going to go through. Do participate. You'll get more out of it. So we are going to look at the Adobe Connect tools first. And obviously, we're going to have a look at the chat pod. Now, I can see people using the chat quite happily there. And uh, people are typing things in there. Oh, I can see Gillian's raised a hand. Um, yeah, Gillian? Um, let's ask a quick question, Jane. Sure. Julie's audio is not working, so I guess where's the audio? It's in the meeting menu at the top left-hand corner. So if I just type that in chat pod, or if you type in that chat pod for her, just to have a look at it. Right. And it's in meeting, and then it's the audio setup wizard. Yep. Right. Okay, so Julie, if you try the audio setup, I can see some people have uh, to We'll have to them. type that in there for a, hang on, Julio. Oh, Julio. <laughs> type that in. <laughs> okay, thanks, Gillian. Um, also, get, just ask her to check that um, a computer icon, you know, they unmute your speakers on the computer thing, that's switched off. Because again, sometimes if that's still switched on, then they won't be able to hear. So. Um, I will oh, okay. continue there. So, <laughs> in the chat pod there, one thing I wanted to ask you all is uh, which webinar platforms have you used before, if any? So if you can type your response in chat there, that just gives me an idea of uh, what you've come across before. Now, this is where I love seeing multiple attendees are typing. <laughs> Somebody mentioned the big blue button uh, to me before there, Will, but I don't think I've seen that one. I just stick with the tools I'm given. <laughs> so we've got quite a few popping up there. 
Um, Ali WebEx is one that I have used before as well. It's not something that we're going to be looking at this afternoon, uh, simply because we were conscious of the time. Uh, however, one of the features in WebEx I really like is the fact that you can tell if somebody's left uh, the room as in they're looking at something else on their screen. So it tells you when the WebEx window loses focus. So you can draw people back in, say they're not paying attention. <laughs> Oh, we've got lots and lots of responses there, lots of different ones as well. Unfortunately, we couldn't cover all of them, but uh, hopefully we'll give you some ideas of what each one can do today. OK, thank you for that, everybody. Now, with chat, obviously everybody's been chatting there, and I can see everybody's responses. We're all chatting to each other, and all those, that chat is shared. However, you can do a private chat. So if you did want to chat to somebody or one of the hosts, and you didn't want everybody else to see, to start a private chat there, you can see my screenshot is literally by pointing to the person that you want to start a private chat with. And then if you click on the name, it comes up with a little menu at the right-hand side, and you can start private chat. Now, one of the nice things about doing this is um, if I have a lot of people attending and I didn't want them to chat privately, I can actually stop that from happening. So I can be a bit mean there. But with you guys, I want you to test it, try it, have a play with it if you like. Setting the status. This is where we can use some of the emoticons, which are useful if you literally just want a yes or no response rather than having people typing lots of things. Now, in Adobe Connect, the set status icon is at the top left hand corner of your screen and it's this icon here that looks like a little fellow wave in his hand there and when you click the drop down you get various options that you can choose from so just to make sure that you've all found where that button is can you give me an agree if you found it and then if you look towards the left hand side of your screen <laughs> So I know then, I disagree. <laughs> you will be able to see the icons popping up in the participants pane. Now, if you're joining us via a mobile device today, sometimes the emoticons do take a while to pop up. So don't worry. If, and they might be in a slightly different place as well. So you might have to look around to find them if you're joining us using a tablet or a mobile phone. All right, so I am actually going to get you to clear the status. So if you go to your status and just clear it for now, only because I want to ask you a question. And the question is, do you intend running online sessions? Go for a yes, agree for yes, disagree for no. I'm just interested who would actually be delivering online, that's all. Oh, quite a lot of you there. That's actually nice to see. Uh, but sometimes it's useful to be able to use the software anyway because you might be a, a developer as opposed to a deliverer. Um, I have been asked in the past to put together online sessions, but I haven't delivered them myself. Not too sure if I'd like somebody else to do that for me, but there you go. Now, the main part of the screen, the content area, is where I'm sharing something with you. And I can actually share different things. What I'm sharing with you at the moment is a PowerPoint presentation. So they're literally slides. And when you bring them into Adobe Connect, you virtually upload them. And it converts them into something that Adobe can read. Now, it doesn't like transitions in PowerPoint very much, but it does allow animations. So some of my slides do have animations on there. So it's not fully functional. It also doesn't like smart art. So if you put smart art objects on your slides, it isn't going to convert them. It will lose them. So as well as the content area showing us uh, slides, I could share things like uh, PDF files, so I could share a document with you. I can share music files, that's what you were listening to when you came into the room first thing. I can also share videos. MP3s, MP4s work the best. I can also share my screen, which I'm going to do a little bit later, when, you show, when I show you our comparison spreadsheet. There is a webcam facility, so I can get everybody to show their video pods. However, it does take a, an awful lot of internet usage in order for all the videos to work. So I haven't actually allowed that to happen for today's session. But if you've only got maybe five, six, seven people, it is quite nice to show you your uh, webcams as well. So there is that feature as well. I've just seen somebody put something in the uh, chat pod there. Um, PowerPoint transitions don't actually work well. 
most of them don't. I have found one that works and it's something like Push, that's the only one. Um, but all the animations seem to work unless you've got very complex animations. It doesn't like it if it's too complicated, so if you are going to use them, keep them simple. Okay, so something else we can use, one of the other tools is a poll, and I'm actually going to bring this poll up on screen so you can see what it looks like and how it works. And my question is, how many webinars or online events have you attended before? And at the moment, I can see people responding. You can't. And when it looks like everybody has responded there, I will share the results with you. Now, I tend to use polls if I want people to feed back to me, but I'm really not bothered who said what. So it's just sort of to get an opinion or um, a generalization about something. And it's just a quicker way than everybody typing in chat sometimes. Now, that looks like everybody's stopped responding there, so I am going to broadcast the results for you. And there we go. So it looks like most people have been on either one to ten webinars or online events. I won't ask you what you thought of them. <laughs> and somebody's been on an awful lot there. Forty plus, there's five of you have been on uh, more than forty. Again, it depends whether you're, they're useful or not, doesn't it? So I'm going to just hide that poll there. So thank you for that. Okay, now this is one of my favorite tools. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, I need to give you all permission before you can perform these techniques. So I'm just changing your permissions there. Uh, just bear with me a second. And I'm going to enable drawing. Now what's happened there is you should see a drawing toolbar has popped up over on the left hand side of your screen there and it's got various tools and the one at the top, the arrow, is just a selection tool so you won't be able to do an awful lot with that. However, underneath is the marker tool and if you give that a click, your mouse pointer is now a pen. If you want to change the colour, down at the bottom you do have a colour option which just looks like a black square and you should be able to choose a colour from there. And then I literally just want you to draw on the, uh, the map of the UK there, just to give me an idea of where you are. If you're not in the UK, you can draw a little arrow pointing away there. Oh, I've got a little cross there over to the left. So I'm assuming that there's somebody who's not in the UK today. Lots of scribbling going on. <laughs> How do you know? It's really strange. Now, something that happens with the drawing tool is that I can turn them on and off to give you access. So I am actually going to turn them off. Now, as soon as I turn off the drawing tools, all of your annotations disappear. However, if I switch them back on again, they will pop up again. So I haven't actually lost them. Oh, now, that's interesting. Somebody's on a boat and fishing. Wow. <laughs> oh, amazing. OK, thank you for that. Now, as well as the marker pen with the drawing tools, on my next slide, I'm going to get you to actually type on the slide. So this is where you can use the text tool. So I've turned the drawing tools on. And then over to the left, it's the button with the capital T. Now, the way that the text tool works is that you have to click it first, click on the slide, and then start typing. But in order to share what you've typed, you need to click away from it. So I've got getting some hellos there. So I'd like to know what your thoughts of the Adobe Connect tools are. What do you think of them? Echo. Now, is that something that somebody's saying? I've got a bit of an echo on my microphone there. Easy to use, look good. Now, the thing is, obviously, when there's so many people uh, typing away on the slide there, it may be that you've typed in the same place as somebody else. So I can actually move these things around so I can grab hold of them, drag and drop them in different places just to make it easier to see. And I generally use this tool if I'm doing a session with maybe eight people. I will literally put their names somewhere on the slide and then get them to type underneath it so that they're not actually over typing where people have already put some information in. This is also a nice technique if you do want people to type something, but you're not too bothered about who's typed it, because in the chat pod it comes up with your name. And then, can you tell me who has typed what comment? <laughs> That's a very good question. 
Um, it doesn't actually tell you in Connect like it does with, I think it does in Collaborate, where you can choose what somebody's typed and it tells you the username. So no, it doesn't. So I tend to use this if I want anonymous responses. I've got another question I can see there. Can the facilitator control who can draw or type at once? Um, Denise, yes, is the answer to that question. Um, basically, I've turned on the drawing tools for everybody. However, Denise, if I choose you in the participants pod there, I can then disable drawing just for you, <laughs> which is a bit mean. So if Denise tries to draw or do anything, the drawing tools aren't available. I will turn your drawing tools back on there, Denise. So you have got a lot of control. OK, so I'm just going to turn the drawing tools off there for a moment. And as I say, there it goes. You think you've lost everything, but it is still there if I turn them back on. You can see, still see everything that was typed there. Now, another facility that's available is something called breakout rooms. Now, I've literally just got a picture of this one, uh, simply because there's just too many people to control, as in what's going to happen in breakout rooms. But it basically means I can split you into groups, and I can send you into a room of your own. I can either do that by choosing who goes into the room, or I can literally split you into uh, equal numbers. So the pictures that you can see here in this pod over on the left is the button that will tell you to start breakouts. And then I can choose how many breakout rooms to create. And then I literally drag and drop the users into the breakout rooms. There you can see I've dragged uh, somebody. And in this one here, it shows that Dawn is in breakout room three. In the breakout rooms, I can join them. So I can go in and give somebody um, host permissions. So they're in control of what happens in that breakout room. And I can give them some group work to do. I'm just sorry, I'm just reading uh, something in the chat pane there. Lost connection. Oh, OK. Ah, sorry. Uh, I've just seen what you said there, Fiona. Bear with me a moment. OK. Uh, and the last image that you can see there is where you can end the breakouts, which will literally bring everybody back into the main room. So then we can discuss what happened in each one of the rooms. So it's a nice way of putting group work together. OK. What I wanted to do now, then, is just cover some of the questions that we got um, before the actual webinar started. And just a few quick ones. Somebody did ask me about what's coming up with HTML5 and WebRTC version. Well, there was just so much information that I could find. I thought it would be easier if I literally just had the um, link there. And what I'll do is I'll put that in the uh, chat pod so you can click on it. It'll also be available in the training community as well. But there's so much in there. Oh, I'm never going to cover all of that in the time I've got. Can you watch recording on an iPad? Well, obviously, um, Flash doesn't work on iPads. So the alternative I have found is to make an FLV file. And there is an FLV app that you can get from the uh, App Store, which is completely free. So you can still watch them after the fact. Animations and transitions I did cover a little earlier. Just don't use SmartArt. It doesn't convert it very well. What main issues do I encounter? Um, it's normally other people's technology and internet connection. I try to get people to avoid using Wi-Fi, because the sound can drop out quite a bit with that. And I try to limit video usage so that um, you're not having too many issues with the uh, high bandwidth use there. Is it useful as a large lecture tool? It's brilliant as a large lecture tool. The only thing I would say there is make sure you have somebody else on hand to keep an eye on the chat, because there's no way that you can do both at the same time. <laughs> I think the most I've uh, lectured to is about 75, and it was really difficult to do on my own. So I did have somebody monitoring the chat. And then one of the other questions was about accessibility features. Again, there was just far too many to include, but if your users are um, visually disabled or there's got um, hearing or any kind of mobility disability, then there's lots of ways around that they can still use the software. Now, Gillian's asking, did I nominate a student to monitor the chat, or was it another member of staff? It was actually another member of staff, only because she is interested in doing online sessions as well anyway. So there's my bits and pieces about Adobe. Any questions, comments, or thoughts before we move on? Again, I am just conscious of the time there. <laughs> 
Gillian's saying it could be a class participant. I totally agree. It can be, you know, anybody who's been on the, a session before knows how it all works and can help other students. It's quite nice that. I can see somebody else typing away there in the chat pod. Are the chat marking text input also recorded? I'm assuming, Sarah, that you mean things that people have written on the screen or typed on the screen. Then yes, all that is picked up as well. Yep. How much training do participants usually need? Um, before I run a session, I uh, obviously invite them to the session with sending them an email maybe a week before and just say that if they've got any concerns they can email me and I will open up the room so they can have a little play just for five minutes so that they're comfortable and confident with it but I generally ask people to arrive at least 15 minutes beforehand so that they have got issues with their sound or anything like that hopefully we can sort them out before the session starts actually in saying they're a tough question <laughs> Okay, if I've missed any questions, I do apologise, but I will come back to the chat later and have a look through to see if there's anything I missed there. So, what I would like to do is hand you over to Gillian, and Gillian's going to tell us about Collaborate, and the screen is going to change slightly there, so I'm just going to change the layout for me. I will mute mine so that we've not got any feedback. Hopefully, we should be able to hear you okay. Over to Gillian. Oh, yeah, okay, hopefully that's clear run the setup again whilst um, Jane was just speaking there. Um, if you could just clear your statuses and then there is a um, speak louder which option you could use if you can't hear me uh, and I'll just keep my eye on that. Oh no, correct Catherine. Jane, have you got any other suggestions that I can? There's a lot of people are struggling you. Jane, I'm hoping you've got other suggestions. Um. Jane's disappeared. That's bizarre. Um, oh, I'm getting some ticks now. So I'm assuming that means it's gone a bit clearer with just fiddling. I wonder whether I've got a loose wire. Jane left. Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> Okay, right. Uh, audio is much better now. Brilliant. Okay, great. It's dropping out at times. I, we were doing that this morning. We've been online all morning, um, and I thought we got it resolved. I'm going to cart on because it looks like the vast majority can hear okay. Um, I'll move the mic a little bit closer as well. Okay. Um, right, one of the questions that came through when people registered was how do we sell it to staff? And I thought I'd just address that one first quickly. Um, and really, I, uh, W I I F T, what's in it for them? I always talk about different scenarios, and hopefully, they will be able to identify with one of those scenarios that will suit to their needs or appeal to their confidence level. Um, when I say suit their needs, it depends on what their job role is, and also some people are more digitally able and confident with the technology than others, which sort of relates back to that question that we had a minute ago about how much training do people need. Um, so I've got a couple of slides just on that, just to give you some examples, and then I'll go through Collaborate specifically. Um, the one thing I do like about Collaborate is I, I haven't used the other tools extensively, by the way. We're all speaking here um, with so as we use it a lot in our own areas, I teach through Collaborate um, on the PG CAT module and I teach distance learning so students are um, accessing via a virtual classroom. Um, and that's the first example that I've used there, uh, teaching and learning through live instruction. You know, we do get online uh, generally once a week for a session. Um, using Collaborate and then sometimes we have some guest lectures coming as well again through this medium. Um, another thing, the second bullet point is we bring virtual attendees into a physical class. Now usually on my module on the first week we do an induction and usually that is in a physical classroom but last time I did that it was interesting because one student said she couldn't get there because of childcare 
and then another one couldn't come because she just had a back up the day before and then another one couldn't come because of transport issues so I had three people display three students on the uh, interactive whiteboard in the classroom via collaborate one on the back with her iPad and the other two sat in front of their PCs but what it meant for them was they could still participate in the class um, and get to know the other students and we still did exactly the same things as we would do if it was just a physical class so we still did like a um, ice breaking exercise it was the first week people needed to get to know each other so they go around and they talk to each other and they do like a form of bingo um, and they go and talk to the PC it's a bit like um, Max Headroom in the old days they go and talk to that PC and they say do you meet any of these criteria on this card so you can adapt your exercises that you would normally do in a physical classroom um, to bring in virtual attendees, which is great for accessibility for students who've got widely participation, childcare issues, travelling, etc., etc. Um, I haven't used it myself for back channeling, but like you do with Twitter, you can use the chat in a physical classroom for back channeling as well. It was an idea I saw somebody else use, but I thought I'd stick that one in. Um, the bad excuses, Paul, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I can see the audios going in and out. So I'll, I'm just trying to hold the mic steady. I'll see if that makes a difference. Um, obviously, for Flip Classroom, you can record your lecture beforehand and then get students to watch it and then. Um, participate in either a physical or virtual classroom you can use it this one's quite nice for tutorials and seminars uh, because they can use it for smaller groups certainly like personal tutorials it's a nice way for an academic member of staff to get to grips with the technology um, just on a very informal basis it's not too threatening you're not dealing with a class of 60 or 200 but just dealing with one person so it's a nice way for non-confident academics to put their toe into the water this audio is a nightmare um, and I'm struggling to know what to do until oh, Jane's got any other suggestions I've tried everything else I'm sure the mic is properly Right. Jane's not sure, right? Just keep keep me updated if anything makes a difference. I'm holding the audio socket just in case that's loose. Gillian, that's gone really, really quiet now. Before it was actually uh, a lot louder, uh, but we were getting lots of buzzing and feedback. So I don't know whether it would be worth. Um, trying another headset and we'll get Fiona to, to speak whilst yeah. you're trying something else. Is that okay? I'll go and have a rummage and see if I can... Fiona, is that okay with you? That's absolutely fine. No problem. Thank I you. shall just mute my microphone and I'll change the uh, screen so that we've got Fiona's uh, go-to. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, hello everyone. Can you all hear me all right? Brilliant. We've got some, some good affirmative yeses there. Thank you. Um, right. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my background so you know what I do. I'm a learning technologist and I've worked both in the UK and the US. And I've um, been working with webinar technology since 2010 when the university I was working for in the US uh, decided to be a very early adopter of um, Cisco Web, Web, WebEx, if I can speak, excuse me, and um, WebEx was a really good training zone for me in terms of finding out about the technology and, uh, and finding out what works and what doesn't work. So I took this information with me into supporting the Troops for Teachers program as part of our School of Education here at Falmer Campus of University of Brighton. So we have been um, working with go to webinar as our solution for that particular program for the last two years. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the really good features of GoTo and some of the less good features of GoTo. And I'll also try and answer the questions that came into the um, attendee survey as I go along. Right. So I'm going to just set my 
timer quickly. So if you hear a seaside sound um, towards the end of my presentation, then that will be the timer. Right, so here's a little visual of what GoToWebinar looks like in the flesh. Um, you're going to see that I've got a little bit of a color coding scheme going on with these slides, um, because what I wanted to emphasize is the fact that as a system, it provides great parity um, across the different platforms. So your experience on a Windows machine is going to be very similar to your experience on a Mac, um, very experience, a very good experience compared to an iPad and so on and so forth. And so what I've done is I've intermixed um, the different platforms so you can see just how similar they are. And um, you'll notice that the uh, Mac slides are purple background. We've got a lighter kind of pinkish purple for iPad, and then we've got a dark blue for the PC. Don't read anything into the color coding scheme, though. <laughs> right. So here it is on the iPad, just to give you a quick look there. And the other aspect of using GoToWebinar, of course, is that it's a very uh, corporate tool. There's some real benefits of it being a corporate tool in that it's actually been very, very reliable. Um, so one of the sort of workarounds we've had, because it isn't integrated with our VLE in any way, um, we've been able to sort of put in a button that allows students to join up to the meetings from the front page of each of their modules. So here's an example of a Troops to Teachers module dashboard in Blackboard. And um, we've got a button there on the left. I'll just show the arrow there, um, which the students click on. That then takes them directly to the join meeting area of the go-to meeting site, and at which point they enter in a webinar ID, and it will kick them directly into the webinar tool. So this is their registration page. All right. Um, so this is the iPad app, just to show you the, the parity of experience here. I think that it's so easy to use. It's just a really great app. And I'll tell you a bit more about it as we go along. So here's a quick interface overview for you. Uh, the main piece of the interface that you use while you're teaching is called the Grab tab. So just quickly show you those different functions. So we've got the obvious things like a mic, a webcam, uh, the option to share screen or application. We have the option to show or pause our screen while we're in screen sharing. We can give keyboard mouse control. We can quickly change presenters. And on the Windows platform only, you do have annotation tools. However, um, when you're sharing PowerPoint from the Mac platform, you can still use the built-in annotation tools um, within PowerPoint itself. So there's the annotation tools, just to give you an idea of what's available. So one of the really compelling features I found in GoToWebinar is that you do have an audience view option. So what I'm showing you in these slides gives you a full view of all of the different kinds of functionalities you have. But what's nice is you can customize this workspace. So anything you see here can be dragged and dropped to the desired location on this toolbar. And you can also remove certain functions if they're superfluous to your needs. So you can actually see a preview of what the audience is seeing, which is really, really helpful. The next option in terms of the screen sharing controls is really, um, I think, very straightforward. I quite like the big buttons. And this has really helped with the uh, training of this tool, because uh, folks have really found that they haven't needed um, all that much instruction to get started on it. It, you know, it varies, but it's been fairly good in that respect. Um, here you'll see I've switched to the Mac interface, again, just to show you the parity of experience. Um, I like how it's very easy to manage your attendees, and we've got several roles that we can boost attendees into. So we can make them a panelist, they can become an organizer, they can be a presenter. The downside is that um, you can't then demote attendees to a lower role. So I think that's a little bit of a, a negative there. They, they end up being in control still, and perhaps they could derail something. Um, here we are still in the Mac interface. And what I wanted to show is the reason why I've got polls showing up here is that actually I've noticed with quite a few of these systems that I've looked at in the past, sometimes 
experience on the Macintosh client is not the same. And uh, sometimes the thing that is missing is the ability to poll. So I just wanted to show that, in fact, you, you get quite a nice display of what the polls look like. And you can um, set up your polls ahead of time, which is quite nice. And here's what the polls look like in the iPad app. And I think the iPad app design is, is the really um, fantastic selling point of the um, go-to webinar system. But I should say that they have apps for all the major platforms, including Windows Phone and um, Android. And the, the actual experience of them is, is fairly comparable in terms of being an attendee. Um, what I would say about the iPad app, which gives it that extra selling point, though, is that you can actually present from it. So I know that Jane mentioned before one of the features she liked about Cisco's WebEx is that you can actually um, monitor how attentive your attendees are. And uh, you can see here that um, we've also got that function available via the dashboard in GoToWebinar. So it gives us a timer of how much time we have. Uh, we can see if the attendees are there, and then we can also see, are they attentive? So as people start to look at other web browsers um, and, uh, and sort of maybe go off to other things on the computer, it does actually show you that they're doing that. The only downside is we actually use Padlet during some of our sessions, so it then shows the students of being inattentive when they're uh, using Padlet, which is not, not the best. <laughs> Uh, if they're typing notes in OneNote, that's a question that's come up in the chat there. Um, it would probably think OneNote was being um, unattentive as well. So, <laughs> yeah, anything other than looking at that, the web browser window um, would count as that. And I don't know how it deals with people who are using the mobile clients either. Um, so the next one down is the questions. Now, the questions tool has been really helpful to us. Um, I think the really... This is probably the reason why we use GoToWebinar still, even though we are rolling out Skype for business across the university as a whole. Um, the reason for it is that it's got, um, first of all, you can pop it out so it's really easy to read. So any one of these tools in the list here, you are able to pop out as its own window. And then also, um, you can choose to send an, a reply to that message privately or you can send your reply to that message to everyone if you think it's a, a reply that everyone needs to see. Um, this has been particularly important to the Troops to Teachers students because um, this is their only contact with an instructor, so they often have quite private questions. And as I move on to the Skype for Business uh, overview, that's the one feature it's missing that we'd really like is to just have more integrated private chat that's available or private question asking. Um, is, is kind of the, the function we're looking for. Um, this is what that same questions tool looks like in the iPad app, and it's just very, very easy to use and access, and it shows you when you've got a reply. Um, so I also really like the handouts function that's been added quite recently to GoToWebinar. So you can see very clearly that the PDF is right there, and you're able to add them ahead of time to your meeting as well. And that's how the handout is accessible on the iPad. I included that because um, frequently with these tools, you find that the handouts are not actually accessible from the mobile app. So I just wanted to raise that as a, an additional function. And uh, this is just to show you how easy it is to also get quick handouts into the session while it's on the go. So I just drag and drop it directly in. Um, in addition to your questions tool, there's also a chat tool, and this has been very helpful because our sessions tend to be quite complex, and we need to have private chat going on um, in a sort of autonomous area between the organizers and the panelists. So this has been really helpful that it's been completely separate so stuff doesn't go to the wrong place. And finally, We've got um, a, a survey tool that's built in. So this is what the survey looks like on the iPad. So as soon as the students have finished the webinar, we're able to send them a really streamlined survey to find out what they thought of it and give us any feedback. 
So just a quick overview of the, that use case I was talking about, which is the Troops to Teachers, the National uh, Qualified Teacher Program. Uh, so we are working with about 40 plus students and staff uh, every week. There's webinars for the most part, and then there's a lot of smaller group sessions, which are facilitated through uh, the go-to meeting client. So that's a sort of minimal version of the go-to webinar client. The webinars are quite long. Um, the meeting links and the, the actual number for the webinar, as mentioned earlier, are distributed in, in advance, usually through announcements in the um, Blackboard areas. Um, we do a, use a lot of the functionality, so screen sharing is something that staff and students do, and particularly for troops of teachers, because it is their only contact time, because for all intents and purposes, they are distance learning students. Um, the video feeds were are very, very important to them because that's their connection with their teachers. And so um, we, we found that having visiting instructors and showing their video up or showing their video up for quite um, long periods of the webinar has been a really positive thing to do. Um, we've also facilitated group work through breakout sessions. Breakout sessions aren't built into the tool like Collaborate or Connect which is a little bit of a shame because we'd love to do them. So the workaround, which is quite um, support intensive, is that the students start and go to webinar, then they all go off in to go to meeting groups to work on group work, and then they come back and present as groups in go to webinar. Yeah, I've seen a little question in the chat there about have there been problems with any um, go to for attendees? Uh, yeah, there have occasionally been issues with um, the web launcher because there is no desktop client for uh, GoToWebinar. It's completely web-based. Um, but having said that, we've had pretty good success across the platforms. We've also had people joining up with very low Wi-Fi connections in uh, the Lake District, um, and they were able to sort of engage. And they were quite reliant on the videos afterwards, though, because there were parts where it would sort of uh, cut out. Um, and we've also had people joining via the audio only as well for that reason. Um, so there's been some innovations that they've come across over the last two years. Um, a little bit like what Jane did, we've been playing music while the students are waiting for the webinar to start. It's not as streamlined as Connect, though. Boy, it doesn't sound nearly as good as yours, Jane, sorry. Um, and uh, we've been using Padlet as a substitute whiteboard because there isn't a whiteboard function in GoToWebinar. Um, and furthermore, because the, the recordings from GoToWebinar have been problematic for a long time in terms of the video, because they were in a proprietary format, um, that's now been changed to MP4, but they don't include the video of the presenters in the video. So that was a real issue for us. So we started using TextMess Relay to record the sessions instead, um, and that was quite support intensive. So I think the, the wish list for students, they would like whiteboards, they've said to me. Um, they also would like greater autonomy to set up their own rooms. And we hope we can facilitate that more through uh, using Skype for Business across the university in future. So that wraps up my GoToWebinar part of the presentation. I'm just going to pull up the question list and just see if anyone had. I think I've covered most of the questions related to Go to webinar, but do type stuff in the chat if you can think of anything. I, I think I've tried to cover things as I've gone along. Fantastic. Right, um, Gillian says she's back, so I think if we if we'll try switching back to her and then we'll come back to Skype for business. Yep. That's great. Now I, I need some thumbs up if you can be okay here. Sorry, if, uh, delegate. Yeah, raise the hand, say that you can hear me OK. Oh, my Rex saying not real is still not good. Oh, no. And it sounded fine in the audio setup, Wizard. It's doing the same as before. Uh, I've got some that can and some that can't. I'm just going to shut down every other application that is running on my PC to see whether that makes a difference. Because we've had three, four headsets actually now. 
Ah, much better than before. I'm wondering if that's it. Melissa, is it still bad for you? Ah, that's looking like it's changing. Marek, I'm, I'm, so you've got a cross. Is it still bad at your end? I agree, better than before, but a bit in and out. Is it bearable? Just go for it. <laughs> Okay, right, that's a yes, let's bearable. Okay, I'm really sorry. We've, we've been on this all morning. We thought we'd resolve these audio issues. So, right, okay. So, right, I'll go back to where I was, which was talking about, um, I think I'd finished talking about personal tutorials, doing them on one, one to one basis. Um, and we're just going to talk about the virtual office where people can advertise a virtual office as opposed to a physical one. And there's a screenshot there of an academic doing that. Now this is um, the next bullet point is about student group work, and that picks up on something I just heard Fiona saying. She said that the students have been asking for uh, being able to set up their own rooms. They'd like to do that, and that's some feedback that we've had from students. Is I um, when I set up my module, I let them I make social spaces and break out relaxing rooms available all the time, so they can go into those rooms whenever they want throughout the course to do group work or discuss project work and so on. Um, and it is something that we have been asked for by students. And I think probably the best practice is where people um, switch on collaborate and it's visible within Blackboard. So people, academics who aren't using it, the students can go into it for themselves and then use that area to do their meetings. Some of the feedback we had was that students didn't like the restrictions of free Skype, that you can only have I think it's five delegates in. So by giving them access to collaborate, even if the academic isn't using it, it means the students can use it. Um, and I've already mentioned social space for students. So right, so like I mentioned guest speakers early. You can bring those in. Um, other, other uses around your typical teaching and learning uses as well are for holding conferences and virtual conferences. Um, we've done that at Salford for a big con uh, cancer seminar. And with our last Spotlight on Digital Capabilities event, we allowed delegates to come in virtually as well when we were sold out so that people could attend. Um, and we've uh, streamed it and recorded the sessions from that. Um, also, virtual meetings. When we were saying before about what's in it for them, non-academic staff and ac academic staff alike often do meetings like we do, Jane and Fiona and I and the others do our USIZER meetings through virtual tools, um, which is great because it saves us traveling. We still do meet face to face, but it actually means as a group we meet more regularly because we don't have to travel. Uh, it wouldn't be feasible for us to travel with the same frequency uh, as we do by fitting in the um, virtual meetings. So for anybody who's working on collaborative projects, or even just across campus, I've tried to get our library staff to um, use the virtual office so they don't have to go to the different library buildings. That's more successful in winter than it is in summer, um, but we have had some success there. Uh, mentoring and coaching for CPD and training. The screenshot here shows somebody using it um, for Excel, um, training through Collaborate. We haven't done that ourselves. That I'll, I'll say there. It's something we want to do, but we haven't done it at Salford. Uh, it's a screenshot I just picked up off online. Virtual open days. We do run virtual open days um, where students can attend an open day. Um, either physically or virtually. And some literature that I'd read by a guy called Norman Simpson suggests doing that in advance of running physical open days. So it's less effort for students to come to the university, have a look around, than it would be obviously to come to a, a physical one. And you can use that as a precursor to a physical one or an alternative to a physical one. It's been very successful in our school built environment. They do it a lot there. But they do a lot of distance learning teaching through uh, Collaborate. Research collaboration um, for people working on international projects is a great tool for that. And also, something we haven't used, but I found this in some literature last night, and I thought, that's a good idea. I'm going to put that in. Public engagement events. You know, We have a, a professional development arm that would probably be interested in using it. Or our university very much attracts local participants, so it's something that we can consider for the future. 
Um, so I hope that answers the question that I forget who posted, but how do you get people engaged with the tools? Um, and it's basically like sussing out what they do as a job and then talking in a language you know, that they can get some benefit from it. What's in it from them? And of course, all the sessions are recorded, like the other software as well. Um, OK. How is it accessed? You can access it through a virtual learning environment. Obviously, it's a Blackboard product, so it's easy in Blackboard, but it does also work with other VLEs and LMSs. Uh, but you can just send people a link as well, uh, a direct link, so they don't have to go through Blackboard. Um, obviously, if they're going through Blackboard, that will manage the authentication. Um, if you are just sending them a direct link, they don't need to authenticate. Um, and another point to make is that the recordings can be exported and stored anywhere. With Somebody was asking about Ultra. Now, that's a product I haven't used, but I've tried to cover uh, a little bit of it in this presentation. Um, and from what I can see on the Blackboard site, that you can't view the recordings currently on a mobile, but that's in development and you will be able to do later on. But you can store them elsewhere, so you can put them on a web page or in uh, your VLE, and they could be viewed through there. Um, so this is what Collaborate looks like. So we, we've got the video up at the top, like the other ones. Now, this is the, um, the Collaborate that I've used and we have at Salford. I'll show you Ultra in a second, the new one that they've just brought out, or Blackboard have just brought out. So, um, you know, we've got the audio box up at the video and audio box up at the top. Sorry, my point is a bit awry. Uh, right, so that's it. Uh, and you can collapse it. You'll see in this screen that the video has gone so that you're not actually looking at the video. Uh, you've got the participants box with the list of the participants down the side, very similar to Connect. And you've got the chat box at the bottom. And then over here, you've got the big content frame, which, of course, you can put your is your whiteboard or your web tour or application sharing in there. OK. Um, I just Another point, uh, somebody asked me questions, was about engagement. And I touched on that briefly before, but I love this slide that I have um, pinched off the internet. I couldn't resist using it, but you can see who it's from, um, Matt Cornick at York, where he's done this flow chart. And this will work in, I'm sure, any of the uh, web conferencing tools. But the dark blue boxes demonstrate tutor-led parts of the session. And the blue box, student activity. So this is how you can bring active learning into your session as you develop your lesson plan. You know, here with that first example, participants can share their rings and what they want to get out of the session. You could do that on the whiteboard, or you could do it as a poll with preset things. Um, then you know, your tutor can go through the content, and then you can check the understanding, better use of polls there, and quizzes. I won't go through it all, but I wanted to leave that in because I thought that was a really good model. OK, so you can bring engagement into the session. So um, like the other applications, the uh, oh, no, it doesn't, actually. We found a difference, Jenny and I, when we were talking before, that uh, Collaborate will dynamically show the largest picture of who is speaking. And the other people who are just listening will be smaller underneath there. Uh, with Connect, she was saying the moderator has to manually do that. With Collaborate, that happens automatically. Though I think you can turn that off. Yes, you can in one of the settings. Uh, but that's quite useful. I think I've always had it set dynamically so that whoever's speaking just automatically becomes larger. So you can see who's actually saying what. Um, having the video on also makes it easy to see what people are up to. Are they actually sat watching, looking interested? You can check their body language a little bit more when they're not using webcams, like like we're not today. You could all be doing your emails or whatever. Um, so that's a good way of checking engagement. Um, however, having the videos on may create a bandwidth issue. I haven't experienced any particularly often. Odd times, I would say, I've had it when I've been teaching. Uh, but obviously, that depends on what your audience are using themselves. 
Okay, uh, so you can have a quick look at the Ultra page. So I'll pinch this again off the Blackboard site. Um, and you can see here, when you're doing the web conferencing part, then um, it, it looks different now. It's a much more contemporary feel to the screen. Again, it's got dynamic display of the speaker um, and then the participants underneath. The, um, it's high definition on Ultra. It isn't on the ordinary um, original version. And then this screen here shows the whiteboard, which you can annotate on. You'll see some on that example. Um, and I think all the delegates can, you can choose whether all the delegates or just yourself annotate on there. And of course, it is available on the mobile. Now, interestingly, Blackboard have taken a mobile first approach with the development of Ultra. They said that they have started afresh. They've not amended the old version. They've written a completely new um, version software, piece of software, and they've done it with mobile first in mind, which was music to my ears. It's a mantra that I've been shouting about for about three years at work. Mobile first, it's where the students are at. Um, so I was really pleased to hear that Blackboard were doing that. Mm. Um, OK, so I'll go over these really quickly, because uh, we've seen some of these tools already in the uh, Connect demonstration, and probably in Fiona's, but I was busy checking for headphones. Um, so you've got the chat box, we've got the emoticons, we've got the polling, which you can change from yes, no to whatever wording you like. And then you've got the raising your hand, which you've already done. So I will uh, go on to the next one. And again, within the whiteboard, standard set of tools there. Um, it has got clip art tools and quite an extensive library of um, templates and maps and things you can pull out. You can do application sharing, so you can see, um, you know, the original versions of PowerPoint if you want to pull up your PowerPoint in there, or whatever other application, Excel, and so on. We made a choice today not to show Collaborate in Connect because we felt that if you're going to put two pieces of web conferencing software and uh, you know, demonstrate one through another, it is sure going to lead to problems. So that's why I'm using PowerPoint slides here. Um, it's got a web tour, so you just type in the URL into the box, and then it will bring the browser up on the contents page. Um, but they don't work on mobile at the moment. But how I get around that is I send delegates uh, the link, and then they can just click on the link in the chat box, and it opens the browser. So that's it fairly easy to get around that one. Um, polling tool, you've seen that already. And here you can see, lost my arrow, there it is, um, some of the different answers that you can select in your poll or key in for yourself. And that's what it looks like on a mobile. So uh, that's the existing version of Collaborate on a mobile. And it is really easy to use on a mobile. I'll come back to that and show you about that in a minute because I was very excited. Uh, and then you can see the uh, results on screen. Uh, they're displayed really nicely in a nice little chart format like Jane's had before. Um, and breakout rooms Jane covered you can do the same thing in Collaborate. And they're fantastic for, for doing group work. Um, really useful, really easy to use. Right, and there's me. Um, and I was saying about how pleased I was with the mobile solution. And you will see there, I have my iPhone. And I can't see the headset, but I have the headset on there. And I um, had one time where I was attending a Collaborate presentation by our Vice Chancellor. And because of the timing of it, I was actually just arriving at Milton Keynes train station. And it's quite a small train station. There wasn't anywhere, really, that I could just sit and down and uh, listen and engage with the webinar. So I just carried on walking across Milton Keynes to the hotel that I was going to. And I was so impressed with how reliable it was. It didn't break the connection once. It was clear. I could use the tools. Um, 
the uh, and I even as you come out of Milton Keynes Station, there is a, a long tunnel that un, goes underneath a dual carriageway. I didn't even lose connection there, and that was on the phone network. I thought it was fantastic. It was really impressive. I was on for about half an hour, 45 minutes, no problems whatsoever. Um, you can send files to students, so that's the uh, file sharing. It's really easy to use, um, shows you the progress of how far they've got. Um, and somebody asked a question about limitations of it. And I think it's probably the same with other um, tools affected by bandwidth and network traffic, possibly even what you're running in the background. If my audio has been OK since, I'm beginning to wonder if that was the issue. Um, so. It, it is reliant on different uh, factors. Having said that, I can say hand on heart, I've not had too many problems whilst I've been teaching with my PG CAT students over the past two or three years. Um, once they get set up and get into the right environment, it's best to do it in a room where you're away from other people if you're presenting so there's no background noise. Um, Ideally, if you're using the webcam, so you've got light onto your face right in front of you, not to the side, because it always looks a bit weird. So there's little nuances like that um, that make a difference. But in terms of getting the students connected, it's not too bad. I did collaborate, offer a 24-7 help desk. And you can either text chat them or raise a ticket. And I rang them a couple of times last night and this morning to ask them a few questions, especially on the ultra. Um, but I said to them, what's your most common problem that you get? And it was with the downloads, because um, earlier versions were use a Java download. And that's where students are struggling. And then it went to, uh, now it's a web launcher. Uh, but the Java download was the biggest problem that they got through their help desk. Um, the uh, and now with Ultra, you don't need that. With the ordinary version, you do need Web Launcher. But as I can see here, that Collaborate does have some built-in safeguards against uh, any connection issues that it automatically reconnects students. It's got audio buffering, which means that you might get a long period of silence. And then you suddenly end up talking like this really fast. And it just goes high pitched for a, a short period while it, it throws the information out really quickly. And then you have got indicators as well that will show where the connection. Um, the time, that's what it looks like on a tablet. There are some restrictions on tablets. And somebody asked about whether they could present from an iPad. No, you can't currently. Um, some things with black border in development, and that will be one of them. I'm fairly sure is the name of the mobile first policy. Well, I think so. I don't know. Oh, hands on art. Uh, but you can't present for an iPad. You can pen for an iPad. Some of the tools are not available, um, like annotating, whiteboard, private text chat, and so on. Uh, but overall, it's easy enough to use, and I like it on the tablet because it's just uh, on the uh, tablet and the iPhone. Because once you've downloaded the app, it's really easy to get in. It just seems to have a lot less problems than uh, the desktop version. And was it not less problems? It was a lot quicker. But that tablet, anyway. Um, so that's what it looks like on a smartphone. Not the best graphic, but you get an idea. And then uh, another thing about it as well is it is will sit on any platform. We'll collaborate with the, whatever VLMS you use. It will integrate with that. You don't have to be using Blackboard Learn to use Blackboard Collaborate. Um, it works with any browser. I'd say Firefox was the best and the most reliable. Explorer the least. Um, I've not used it with Safari, though, so I can't really comment on that. Um, and people use Firefox. Um, it says somebody asked about accessibility, and it does work with screen readers and keyboard only. On a mobile, you can pinch and zoom, and it works to WACG guideline 2 level A. If that's sufficient for the person that asked about accessibility, uh, and obviously it works on different devices. 
well. And um, again, that's just another picture of Ultra. Um, what I've done though is I've put a link at the bottom that gives a list of Ultra features. With the Collaborate um, Ordinary version, you can try it. You can get a two-week trial. You can't do that with Ultra currently. I just don't think we've got around to releasing it. I don't know. I just asked that this morning. And, uh, that isn't currently available. Another thing about Ultra is that it does work on a Chromebook as well. I haven't used it, so I can't really comment on it. I've seen it in action. It looks nice. Um, I pulled out Blackboard's uh, roadmap, so you can see the bits that are in development. For us as a university, we're probably going to go to it um, for some users and not others. For the, particularly for this reason over here, a lot of our staff use break, breakout rooms. The ones that are using it for full class teaching in the school environment and distance learning courses, and that would be a tool that they would want to keep. So for now, they will stick with the original version, and then we will look at uh, any new users who want to use it in a less sophisticated manner. They'll probably use the ultra version that looks nicer and got less functionality. Um, okay, I think that's it. Right, I will stop there. I'll read through the questions because I'm conscious that we've just run over time. Okay, thank you, Gillian. Um, your sound is going in and out there. So, <laughs> what I'm going to just to suggest to everybody is we are going to continue, and Fiona's uh, going to go through her last little bit, only because we're recording the session. But we are aware that we have gone over time, and if people do need to leave, then we, we appreciate that you might have to. So, I'm going to pass over to Fiona and just change the screen there. Mentioning that we'll send the link out. So how will people access if they've got to go now? How can they catch up on the bits they've missed? Yep. So we will send the recording via an email message to everybody. It'll also be on the USIZER website, and it will also be on the training community. And any links to the comparison chart will also be on those places as well, so people can still get access to them. But uh, I think Fiona's going to uh, go for a Skype for business, and uh, is that okay, Fiona? Sure thing. Okay, so yeah, I've also popped a link to the comparison chart into the chat if you fancy taking a look while I talk through this. Um, <clears throat> so Skype for Business, formerly Link until very recently, still in a bit of a transitionary phase in terms of branding, you may have noticed. Um, there, isn't a, there isn't a lot going on in terms of um, finding out when Skype for Business and Skype accounts are going to be completely intercompatible, but I did find that the roadmap for Office 365 is really informative about changes that are coming to Skype for Business. For example, new apps will probably be released this autumn, and uh, that's really encouraging because um, the apps obviously are still showing up as link. Um, so I have put a link, a link for that um, in at the end of this presentation so you can have a look at the roadmap. Um, so Skype for Business. I'm currently in a bit of a training phase with staff here at the University of Brighton um, because uh, the good thing about the change from Link to Skype for Business is that we now have some brand familiarity. So most people have used Skype or they know about it. Um, they've probably used it in their personal lives. Um, but the downside of that, too, is that people don't know necessarily what Skype for Business is fun uh, capable of in comparison to um, what what regular old Skype does. Um, so you don't have the limitations on attendees. There are many other additional features that we find. And so the most of the training on campus here happens through our training team. Uh, but I have been doing a little bit of um, sort of informational sessions for academic staff as well. So we are joined uh, in the chat by Jill Shackwalk, who uh, who is one of our training team members. So thank you for coming, Jill. And I'm sorry that you have to go, but hopefully you can catch this on the recording. Um, so here's a little demo of what I've been doing with staff. Um, essentially, we've been doing a bit of a card matching exercise so that folks can understand the difference in the functionality between the two systems. Um, so we start with two of each card. And what the staff need to do is to match which functionalities go with which piece of software. And this is very you know, analog task, but it's worked so well for helping people to think about the kind of potential that Skype for Business might have 
when applied to day-to-day -day meetings, but also to supporting learning and teaching. So here's a quick uh, screenshot of one of our uh, tri-weekly team meetings that we have via link, uh, now Skype for Business. I apologize if I occasionally lapse into link land. Um, the, this was a really helpful way for us to become fully versed in the tool. So I highly recommend you know, scheduling regular meetings via the tool that you're using just so that you get familiar with the kinds of bugs that might come up and, and other troubleshooting needs. And I think that Gillian also mentioned that. Um, one of the major benefits of using Skype for Business is it is integrated with Outlook. So all I have to do in either the Windows or Mac version of Outlook is to schedule a new Skype meeting. And it's just so streamlined when I'm trying to schedule a meeting. You can see this is a meeting invite that you would get. And um, you have meeting options which can control the security of the meeting room. So the link that's produced in the actual invite you can then share with people through your VLE or in other places, but you can have that meeting room be an open meeting room, which people can join at any time. So they can join ahead of time, so they get a bit of practice to make sure that their audio is working and all of that kind of thing. But then they can, um, you can reuse that meeting room over and over again, or you can do a distinct meeting room that just um, is for the purpose of that one session, has higher security controls controls over the different roles and so forth. Um, so here's a little review just like what I did for GoToWebinar in terms of the different tools that you've got available to you. So you've got chat, as you'd expect. You've got control your own audio, control your own video, and you've got presentation tools. Particularly, I'd, I'd uh, highlight OneNote as being a real bonus. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute and uh, also attachment tools. And then we've got uh, our participants list and actions related to participants as well. So here's a quick view of the lobby. As I did with GoToWebinar, I'm just highlighting a few of the key functions that I think are quite good in this system. Um, so I'm not going to go through it all. But I do like the way that the lobby shows up so you can see who's waiting to come into the session. Uh, there isn't an, a way to play audio in the lobby, unfortunately, not that I know of at this time or I've been able to make work. The next option here is uh, that you can, you can see along the bottom there, if I just use my uh, little annotation tool, you can see that we have the option to present um, various different options. So we've got the desktop. We've got specific programs we can share. We can share a PowerPoint presentation, but we found that's um, a little bit buggy. It certainly isn't working too well on the Mac side at the moment. Um, we've got a whiteboard tool. We've got a polling tool. And we've got a Q&A tool. So there's plenty of variety there. And then when you actually share an application, as in presenting a program, I do like the way that it shows you these little previews of what's going on in your program so you know clearly which one you are going to share with your audience. So here's sharing specifically OneNote, which has its own area of that presentation tool. Um, I think that there was a recent uh, thread on the alt members list just a couple of weeks back about how valuable OneNote can be as a, a shared note-taking tool. And I think this could add some extra functionality, particularly referring back to GoToWebinar when we were talking about using Padlet live in sessions. It would be great to have accumulative notebooks that are used to support different modules. And they're shared. And then any notes made during the session can be shared. And that also relates back to accessibility um, because uh, sort of with changes to DSA and such, it would be good to have shared notes that are um, available to class members. So, And that's what the view that I just showed you in the presenter mode looks like to the attendee. So when you're sharing a OneNote notebook, that's what it looks like to the attendee. And it automatically adds information about the meeting to the OneNote notebook for you. Here's an example of presenting a PowerPoint. So what I like about this is you can see it's clearly sort of prioritizing the video of the presenter down there on the bottom right-hand side. 
Um, so I'm speaking and it knows to prioritize my video. Also, with the whiteboard functionality, you have the option to send it to OneNote, and I think that is compelling. And furthermore, with the whiteboard, you can tell who has done which annotations. So that was a question before. You are able to track changes on the, the whiteboard and see who's done what. Um, another option also available underneath our presentation tools is the polling. Um, the polling is, I think, really great. Um, unfortunately, it's not available on the Mac client at the moment, the actual desktop client. And in general, as a result of this, we recommend that everyone joins up via the web clients for a more standardized experience, regardless of platform. So I think it's got very good choices about how the results are shown and um, and also to actually clear the, the vote so you can use a poll again. Because sometimes I find with the other systems, you can't clear out the poll very well. So once you've used it, it's then used and you can't use it again. But if, if something went wrong and you wanted to reopen it and clear the results, I quite like the fact you can do that. I have found, though, that sometimes it's possible for people to derail the poll if, if you haven't got them in attendee role. Um, but I think we've pretty much ironed out that kink now. Um, so the next slide we've got here is, um, I think, a great feature. It's the question and answer feature. And what I like about it is it actually turns off the instant messenger um, messages area of the tool while you're using it. So you can really concentrate on having a real uh, a Q&A part of the session, which I think is important because I think sometimes when it's all chat based, it's easy to miss some of those most important questions that might be related to coursework. And uh, the attachments, I think, are very streamlined. So you can see you've got the option to add an attachment. You can actually define permissions on the attachment. And then from the attendee viewpoint, the attachment just comes up in a pop-up window on screen. The chat, as I mentioned in the earlier presentation, um, is a little bit of a sticking point for us with the Troops to Teachers program, just because it isn't um, it isn't private in the same way. So everything in the chat is seen by everybody in the session. And um, that that's a bit of an issue. Also, one of the really big pluses of Skype for Business is that it produces absolutely fantastic videos of the session. So you get a very high quality MP4 video. Um, it includes the video feeds of the attendees and the presenters, whomever is enabled for that. Um, but it does also show the chat on screen, and that's something that we um, probably wouldn't want with the Troops to Teachers program because they want to keep their chats private. And uh, there are our meeting actions there. And there's a very quick overview of what the iPad app looks like. Uh, you can see up on the top left-hand side we've got chat. Uh, we've got a calendar so we can go into calls, but it's quite basic. At the moment, it's still branded as Link, as I mentioned, and uh, it's more of uh, you just kind of access the video feeds. Uh, but you can, if they are sharing an application or desktop, you usually see that within the app. So I'm not going to have time to go through these little case studies that we had, but I'll let you look at those later because we will be sharing these presentations. Um, but we have used it in a few different cases with uh, academic programs. At the moment, we are kind of pushing it first as a meeting tool for staff to use. Um, and we are doing these sorts of implementations on a case-by-case -case basis. So some uh, they tend to be smaller groups of students we're working with at the moment, and we're kind of building it up gradually. So it has been used for action learning sets. It's been used for um, to remotely produce materials for a student who couldn't physically be on campus. Um, it's been used for our community university partnership program. Um, what was interesting with that, just very quickly, is that um, the participant who was on the West Bank of Gaza actually used the Link uh, app on their phone and was able to give people a video tour of Gaza, um, of West Bank. And uh, I think that was really interesting and something people highlighted as being very valuable um, is being able to bring all these delegates in from different countries, some of them 
did have some connection issues, but it apparently went very well. Um, <clears throat> so here are the, the links for you at the end here, and uh, I'm sure that you can engage with those later on. I see that there's a private chat question here. Um, oh, someone was asking about where did the webinar solutions comparison chart originate from. I created it on Monday afternoon. <laughs> um, it's created from a, um, basically I went through just about every system that's there and, and tried to find all of the different functions that um, the different webinar systems had together with notes I've had over the years of what kind of functions people are looking for and then I uh, made it into a spreadsheet um, which I hope will answer any outstanding questions because I know that we haven't had a chance to go through all the questions, um, but I did try my best to kind of answer them in that Google Doc for you. So um, I'm just taking a quick look through the spreadsheet just to make sure I haven't missed any questions. Um, I see Skype for Business can support up to 250 attendees. Has anyone tried this many? We haven't yet, um, but it is our goal to sort of scale it up and use it eventually for the Troops to Teachers program and other larger scale programs. Um, yep, I think we haven't been able to customize Skype for Business anymore. Um, there was a question about whether it was possible to make it more academic friendly. I think that part of the rebranding that's occurring though is that um, it, I, I think it is becoming more friendly. It's more approachable, I think, even with the name change, people sort of feel like it's something they can use. Um, and then there's a question about can recordings be used as learning objects? Not currently, but they they are um, much better than, say, the GoToWebinar recordings. Um, and the accessibility features are actually fairly good compared to, say, GoToWebinar. They're, they're much more um, expensive and they are outlined in uh, Microsoft's documentation. So I think I've pretty much covered most of the questions that would come up there. Um, any other questions in the chat? No, I don't think so. So Jane, I might be, we might be ready to wrap up. Hey, thank you. Um, there was one question there. Recordings better in what way? The quality? Um, I think, as I mentioned, the issue with GoToWebinar is that it include the actual recording, the, the video of the people who are presenting. So you've got your webcam, and it's not actually including that in the recording. And for a program like Troops to Teachers, where it's very important for them to be able to visually connect with their virtual instructors, um, they, they found <laughs> that it wasn't very good to just have this sort of abstract acousmetra, you know, disembodied voice. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, I've just brought the polls up there because uh, we have overrun quite a bit there, so apologies for that. But if you could just fill in the polls for me just to uh, let us know what you thought about the webinar, whether it was useful or not, uh, and which resources you'll use, it just helps us decide <laughs> what's the best place to put things on, <laughs> to be fair, more than anything. And it does look like... Oh. Um... <laughs> Ah, there we go. I just had a funny thing going on with the last one there. Okay, now it looks like everybody's uh, completed those, so I am just going to hide those uh, for the time being. And then I'm just going to go back to my uh, my last slide, which is literally about the next webinar, which is going to be about MVivo. Can it be supported by Blended Learning? That's on the 9th of November, and we will let people know um, more information about that one. And last thing I want to say is just thank you for attending. I hope it has been useful this afternoon. We've certainly enjoyed uh, sharing our um, adventures with all these different uh, tools that we use. And um, uh, we will publish everything so that you can see um, where everything is. And obviously, the recording will be available as well. Now, to leave the room, you literally just close out of your browser window. You don't need to do anything special. And we hope to see you on the next webinars.